We have tumultuous times right now with war and many other things on the table, and I'm glad to have a guest with me today, Andrew Henderson, founder of Nomad Capitalist. We're going to be talking about many different things to do with different citizenships, where you might possibly want to move. And I just want to say that I'm happy to announce that I will be speaking at Andrew's event, which is in Kuala Lumpur later this year. So definitely check that out and there'll be a link in the description description of this video. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Uh, well, it's my pleasure. And we're both in these very transient spaces with bad <laughs> lighting and like some weird like sheep. I don't know who the hell picked out this lamp, but we're going to have to really bring it today for people. <laughs> yes, at least we're on the same time zone, though, because yes. <laughs> you travel around. So uh, yeah. and as do I, and we just so happen to be on the same time zone doing this, which is fantastic. So I can't tell you how many times speaking of the event in Kuala Lumpur, and by the way, it's called Nomad Capitalist Live, not to hijack your show. But I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many times I've been in Kuala Lumpur just living there because I've got a home there and I'm on some show in Austin, Texas, and the guy only records at 3.30 p.m. on a Tuesday. It's like, well, that's like bloody 4.30 a.m. or something. Like, ah, that's when I do it. So yeah. uh, it's good that we could be in the same place. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, so I actually asked my audience if they had any questions for you, and they came up with some good ones. It will be uh, fun. I, I think they're quite loaded questions because I'm not even sure if there is an answer. So I'll start off yeah. with the most popular one, which is what do you think, if there is any, is the best country to live in the world right now or best countries to live in the world? Well, just to take a step back, I mean, my philosophy is go where you're treated best. My father said those five magic words when I was 12 years old and I've applied them for much of my adult life. Um, so the very nature of what I do is you you choose from the buffet. You don't rely on one friend to fulfill all your needs. You have different mm -hmm. friends. You have the one friend you go to the pub with and that's kind of what you do. You have the one friend that you go uh, you know, sailing with. You have the friend that you go uh, intellectual stuff, museums, whatever. I look at countries the same way. So. Uh, I think, you know, for me, in my perspective, the best transactional banking without a lot of fluff is Singapore. Could you live in Singapore? Sure. Is it needlessly expensive? Are there more rules than I would like? Is it a place where real estate is extraordinarily expensive for foreigners? Yeah. And so I just don't think Singapore is the best. I have stuff all around the world from where my websites are hosted to uh, where my money is, to where my you know asset protection structures are, to where my company is incorporated. None of those are where I live. Mm -hmm. And the places where I do live are perfectly fine with that, um, much more so than where I'm originally from in the United States. So, I mean, where do I maintain homes? I'm in Ireland now. I've been checking out Ireland. Um, it's maybe not the best kept secret. I've, I've spent some time. I think it's maybe a, a manageable place in Western Europe that has fewer of the problems of many of the Western countries. And it's and it's just more pleasant. Um, mm -hmm. So for someone who has a soft landing to an English speaking country, that could work. Uh, I've lived the longest actually where Nomad Capitalist Live is going to be in, in Kuala Lumpur. I've been there as a part time resident for about 11 years. I love it there. I think it's a tremendous amount of what I call soft freedom, uh, mm -hmm. very tax friendly, people friendly, friendly people. I was just in Colombia where I have a small home. Uh, I mm -hmm. like that. Although if you don't speak Spanish, it's a little bit harder. It feels a little lonely after a while if you're not, I, mean, I, I can speak some, but I'm not perfectly fluent to like get into complex conversations. And then, you know, for people who, and I've had some members of my team who've come on from places like the UK and Ireland, where mm -hmm. they go out to where we have people in Serbia or Georgia, and they're like, hey, this is just total freedom. Uh, particularly in Georgia, very warm people, very hospitable people. Serbia is more like, leave me the hell alone kind of vibes. So, I mean, those are places where I own property, where I've spent time. I like some better than others. But I think, you know, I can I can prognosticate all about, about all the other places. But I like places that are off the beaten track. I like places mm -hmm. within those countries that are not as popular. So I'm not in Medellin, where a lot of the nomads are. I'm in Bogota, in Colombia. You know, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, I think is the best city in, in, in Malaysia, but I'm not in Bangkok next door in Thailand. I'm in Kuala Lumpur. I like to go to places that are a bit underrated, that are a bit off the radar. I don't want uh, to be overrun with foreigners who have different interests than I do. And so that's where I live. And I guess that's the best indication of what I think is the best. But, you know, <laughs> it could change on a dime and that could change tomorrow. So that's why I think you want to have more than one. Yeah, yeah, no. And I think that's really smart because 
because like everything is changing constantly. It's a fluid situation. I mean, we know in Canada, for instance, that things have gone really downhill over the past five to six years. You know, in 20 years, hopefully, maybe things are going to be better. So things are changing all the time. And I think it's important to be in a place. I know a lot of people, they want to they want to just be set on one country specifically but the way I've kind of opened my mind up to it is kind of similar to your philosophy where it's like you have to be open to other places and you can't just say oh I'm gonna live here for the rest of my life and that's it because you know yeah. residency rules could change all kinds of things crime you don't know so you want to be a little polyamorous um I the nomad and nomad capitalist. I mean, I have been and I am to a lesser extent now nomadic. I, I move between different bases. I created what's called the trifecta method, where you spend four months in three different places, depending on what they are. They could be tax friendly. It's also just a place to see different places, opportunity, culture, food, all that. But if you want to live in one place, it's fine. But the nomad really means kind of like the nomads on, on the Mongolian steppe. When your source of food, when your source of uh, sustenance goes away, you got to move on to the next spot. And I think that, you know, we have one of the guys speaking of this year at the event, his parents moved to Australia from Sri Lanka. And normally mm -hmm. immigrants or children of immigrants have a very hard time moving. He didn't. He moved to the UAE. That's the place where he thinks is the best. We disagree a little bit on that, but but that's where that's the best for him. You know, this idea that, hey, maybe Australia was good for 30 years. Australia has done a lot of nasty things recently. And I mean, yeah. on the tax front, on the personal freedom front, like it is... I, I don't understand who's going to Australia. We helped a lot of people move out of Australia as clients. Uh, I say to myself, even if you're going to stay in one place, be open to what's the next place. Yeah, people like this sense of certainty, but but look at it this way. Look at your relationships, right? Uh, I had a friendship of about 10 years. I've had friendships, you know, probably my oldest friendship at this point is that I talked to. The person is 18 years old or so. I had a friend that I'd known for nine or 10 years, and we just kind of we just kind of drifted apart. Uh, I don't look at that as the person's a bad person. I don't look at that as something went wrong. I just realized, you know, they were going in a different direction. I wanted to be a bit more positive. They were kind of struggling with some stuff. I didn't want, they didn't want my help. And so do I look at that and say, well, hey, if I can't make a friend and this friend's not going to be my friend until the rest of my dying days, like I'm not going to make the friend. No, like you enjoy it for what it is. You celebrate that and then you move on. And people have this very hard time moving on. Uh, and they they come up with all kinds of good sounding excuses how, like i'm running from something yes when i was 25 years old yes running to all the uh you know the beautiful women of you know, all the countries you know and i had some great relationships you know like running to learning how the world is evolving in in places like asia they come up with all these little stories about how if you if, the, if you can't plan it the rest of their lives with 1000 percent certainty and i'm like yeah that's not supposed to work like somehow there's something wrong with go bring your treat best it's like no go where you're treated best is competition and action you do it for like buying chicken wings but you don't do it for where the country you give half your money to it's it's very odd to me. <laughs> yeah yeah I, I totally agree with that yeah it, it is bizarre and i think a lot of people now in canada and america too uh there's a lot of people retiring so i think because they're retiring as well like the idea of traveling around is kind of difficult for them but they yep. still want to go somewhere where they're treated best and basically most of those people from what i hear and there is a lot of people i get get comments and messages all the time from people who are leaving Canada and the United States. And most of them tend to gravitate towards like the Americas, but yep. they never look at like Asia. I'm looking forward to going to Kuala Lumpur because I've heard so many great things about it. It's affordable. They speak English. The services are really good. It's yep. as close to a first world country as you're going to get in like one of these kind of offshore tax haven type places. So yeah, I'm really looking forward forward to that it's a real country yes. it's not like an island of twenty thousand people and you go stir crazy um mm -hmm. but no i i, I think and listen i I'm, I'm saying this with empathy because obviously what i help people do is figure this stuff out i shepherd them from point a to point b and our, well, not for the event necessarily but for our clientele i think people are scared and it's the first generation now of people where look at the wall street journal i mean going to ecuador to retire is becoming a thing and for some of those people yeah. it's kind of out of necessity yes um, i agree 
best rated places are Ecuador and Mexico and Panama and people are moving there because it's cheaper because they're only living on social security. The same way you have people who are in our generation in the US now who they're struggling. Now we can argue if they should be doing more or not. I, I don't live there to know, but I just, mm -hmm. I just feel like a lot of people in the Western world now are struggling. And I have mm -hmm. to think it's partially because of what Steve Bannon, the Trump advisor said, we hollowed out the middle class in the United States and we built one in Asia. As a person who has spent much of my my life for the last dozen years in Asia, and as a person who's seen the, the beautiful people in Malaysia and other countries around there and invest in Cambodia and Indonesia, I'm happy there's a middle class in Asia now. I'm happy there's a very nascent middle class in Africa. We're going to be talking about hotspots in both those places you can invest in uh, mm -hmm. at the event. But I'm happy that those people have an opportunity now. Uh, am I happy that that's perhaps part of the reason why it has come at the expense of the average person who used to have it pretty easy in the US, got a high school degree, got a job, bought a five bedroom house with three cars, you know, life was good. Um, yeah, I don't think that just because you're born in the United States, you should have it so much better at the expense of people all around the world. I think there's opportunity. Yeah. We have we have clients who are from Vietnam who have $100 million self-made from a village in wow. Vietnam. Nobody gave them anything. So if they can mm -hmm. do it, you know, sorry. I, I don't really feel sorry for the guy in, uh, you know, in, in Alberta. I've made most of my wealth outside of the United States at this point. So I just, I think people are afraid where they see what's happening and it's scary and they feel like I want to live here. That's, that's true of all human beings. But I, I just think we have to get over that fear and we have to accept things as they are. And the United States and Canada and I suppose the UK are not what they once were. And you no. can sit around and fight and pound your fists and say, this isn't right. Listen, I'm nobody. You're nobody. Nobody's mm -hmm. anybody. One person, nobody cares about you, especially in a country like the United States. You're a pawn. Yeah. Go to a country with a million people and maybe then you'll have some kind of say. You live in the mm -hmm. US, you don't matter. Yeah. I didn't matter. Just go where you're treated best. Yeah, that's that's very true. And you renounced your U.S. citizenship, correct? I did. Yeah, about six, uh, almost six and a half years ago. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So, and and that's another fear. Like, <laughs> you don't hear that so many times. People renouncing their citizenship. Uh, I mean, there's thousands of people every year. Um, there's new records being set quite frequently, and we don't even I don't think know the full accurate statistics. I don't think the government wants to put those all out. It's just I think it's notoriously somewhat riddled with heirs, the list they put out, but thousands of people yeah. renounce their citizenship every year now, um, up from hundreds not so long ago. And it's people generally like myself who had lived overseas for a substantial period of time. I didn't even want to go to the US. And mm -hmm. you know what I you know what made me realize there was no like particular thing that said I'm going to renounce US citizenship. I had thought for years about doing it. I don't really agree with a lot of the stuff the country does. I didn't feel proud to be an American. I actually felt kind of embarrassed when you'd go somewhere and here's my American passport and people lump you in. Sometimes people just hear my accent and they love mm -hmm. me in and think I'm some, you know, NATO bombing, like nasty <laughs> guy. I, listen, I mean, I had that happen. I hosted a party in Vienna and some some women uh, gave out to me that like, uh, because of my accent, I have no business commenting on US politics. I gave up one of the best passports in the world in protest. But what I realized was I didn't even want to go to the United States. I didn't even want to have a layover. If I went from Mexico to somewhere in Europe, I would avoid even flying to the US just to avoid dealing with them. Uh, yeah. And yet, you know, I still had all the requirements of being a US citizen which are some of the most onerous in the world. And, you know, that's one thing. But mm -hmm. the bigger thing for me was that the average citizen that would watch a video and comment or that you just interview in the street would say, yeah, that's, that's damn right. He was born here. He has to pay. Well, I thought mm -hmm. citizenship was a benefit that you were like part of the tribe and you yeah. benefited from what the tribe is doing. And if you weren't using the tribe's resources, then you have to pay. And they just kind of, okay, you're living over there now. But no, what's happened is people have increasingly become angry, which I think anger is a response to powerlessness. People feel powerless. They, their lives have changed in the West. Life isn't so easy anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So they're angry. And their anger yeah. is directed at me because I don't want to live in their country. And it wasn't yeah. that I left to avoid taxes. Um, that wasn't the very first thing that motivated me when I was 15 years old when I move overseas. I didn't really know that much about taxes when I was 15. Uh, I mean, I, I, I believed in low taxes, but I didn't know what it was like to pay. To, I, get it, I hadn't felt it yet, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the fact that the culture is so angry now, that's like that guy, even though he never even flies through our country, should pay because he was born here, even though his money's all made overseas. I said, that's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse as the momentum of these countries goes the wrong direction. Everything has momentum. The West, yeah. most of negative momentum. You don't stop mm -hmm. a country of 330 million people moving very quickly in the wrong direction very quickly. It doesn't, doesn't stop fast. It takes a long time to turn that around. It's like, like an alcoholic. It has to hit rock bottom and then maybe it'll 
world turn around. And yeah. I just said, I, you know, I don't have how many years to endure this abusive relationship, wondering how much more abusive it will get. Uh, I'm going to give up my passport and make sure that I'm covered. And, and listen, since I've given it up, I mean, you've seen they have even stopped people from renouncing during the pandemic, even while oh, the, embassy, wow. the embassies were open for other services, but they wouldn't do renunciations. So, I mean, they, they, you can't even do it. I mean, that's pretty sick. Yeah, that's becoming almost very authoritarian. And that's what I see in the West, unfortunately, a lot is a lot of the countries now are becoming very authoritarian. And even, you know, people will argue left, right and between two different parties. And the way yeah. I really see it is they're all they're all cut from the same cloth and pushing similar agendas. So it's hard to really I mean, like Republicans and Democrats, people are so divisive on both sides, but you get either one in and maybe it's slightly better but it's mostly the same agenda and policies that are pushed and you know people will agree with authoritarian right policies but then as yeah. soon as it's authoritarian left they're like no 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 so you can't you can't have it both ways i feel i've told this story before when I, when I first decided, yes, I'm going forward, I'm starting Nomad Capitalist, it was at first just kind of a blog, just me traveling and, and writing. And eventually people came and asked me for advice. Yeah. Um, I was in Turkey and I was sitting next to a guy going from wherever to wherever in Turkey. And he worked, I think, for the UN. I forget kind of the story as the years go by, but I think he worked for the UN and he was telling me how they get policy achieved. And he seemed like a left-wing kind of guy. And he's like, I'm like, why don't you just tell people, and this is my naivete, and I still operate like this in my business with my employees and people in my life. Like, I just pretty much tell people what I think and people know they can that I'm going to be authentic. And I'm like, why don't you just tell people the end result? It's like, no, 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 because people will swallow incremental change, but they won't swallow. Like if you just say like, hey, let's get to like this, this, you know, let's have a wealth tax. They're like, that seems scary. But if you kind of, you know, take small steps to get there, eventually they'll swallow it. Yeah. And that was scary. But listen, look at what Trump just said not too long ago about this abortion fight. And I'm sure somebody will be upset with me for saying this. But for years, Republicans in the United States said, OK, listen, overturn Roe v. Wade, no more US wide, you know, right to abortion, throw it back to the states. We're states rights people. I was watching debates back that same year when Obama got reelected, 2012. States rights, mm -hmm. states rights, states rights, says the, says the Republicans. Now they got Roe v. Wade overturned, which I think has led, you know, some people to want to leave the US from the left wing saying, I mean, this is mm -hmm. not advanced. And now what am I seeing? Now the Republicans are like, oh, it's not a states rights issue. Let's ban it nationwide. And it's like, wait a second, your political tactics are no better than the other sides. I'm more right wing, I suppose, particularly economically, but I was never in lockstep with the American right wing by any means. And people find that there's another reason people find me very confusing. If you don't agree with every single thing Trump's ever said, you're like a, you have Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, <laughs> but on that, it just kind, of, just kind of once again showed me the true colors of, of, you know, each party and the party that maybe I'm a little bit more inclined to agree with just partially because economic issues are more are important to me. It's like, oh, you guys have been saying something for decades. And now that you finally got it, you're doing exactly what the guy from the UN does. And you're just kind of like spoon feeding people stuff that they want to hear. And you're being mm -hmm. disingenuous. Um, if you think that system is going to help you go where you're treated best or be where you're treated best, you're you're crazy, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. And you know, I moved from the UK to Canada. And part of the reason why I moved from the UK to Canada was to better my life. But the thing that I've realized over like the eight or nine years that we've been in Canada now is like it things go downhill and you look back at what it was like when you came and you think, wow, this is totally different. And I also look at my home country, the UK, which I only visit once a year. And because you're out of that country most of the time, you, you go back and you notice how things are getting progressively worse, like you say, where you're actually there. It's very hard to actually see it because it's all happen happening so gradually, like you said. So all these policies and different things that are being put in it. I mean, even in Canada now, there's sense to shit things that are being pushed through and you know people seem to think that if we just elect this guy he's gonna just get rid of all this stuff because he might agree with it in some ways because he can use it to further his agenda as well so i think it's it's sort of a weird situation that we're in because it's it's almost like a wealth transfer from the western countries that have 
always held the wealth to other countries like Asia, where a lot of the wealth has gone since 2008. And part of my story was like, I was an engineer back in the UK and the company I worked for made healthcare products. And that company that went to China, and this was after 2008 and everything like that happened. But many companies were going to China at that point. And the UK used to be a big manufacturing country and make most of the world's products yeah, at one point. I, you know what? I, I had a friend of mine, one of those long running friends from a previous business. He said, you know what your superpower is, is you don't get nostalgic. Now I do yeah. a little bit. I remember I made a video about a year ago on our YouTube channel where I said um, one of the big legacy radio stations, KDWN in Las Vegas, big booming. You could hear it all over. You could hear it in Canada at night <laughs> in the winter. This station was a big station broadcasting all over the Western uh, North America. And eventually the tower site, which at the time was in the middle of nowhere uh, when I was a kid, Art Bell was on this station. I mean, just legacy, great historical radio station but las vegas grew so much to where this middle of nowhere tower site became quite somewhere and they tore the tower down and they handed in the radio station license i think to build an amazon warehouse because they could get tens of millions of dollars for the land and what's an am radio station worth i mean so you know mm. the world changes and that was a little sad to me but like what am i going to do about it i was in the radio business at one point and i did relatively well for myself not as well as i have done in this business by far but uh i enjoyed it i could have tilted at windmills and just said i you know i'm going to stay in the radio business for the rest of my life because i i really hope it works i mean mm. hope hope doesn't get you anywhere i think a lot of people are no. hoping and, and and as an entrepreneur my entire life even you know ever since i was 12 years old i wanted to be an entrepreneur i i realized no one's going to do it except you and i look at everybody who you know on youtube is relying on co labs or everybody who's relying on referral partners in their business. I mean, I like to rely on myself and I like to rely on my team. You can't rely on anybody else if you're going to win. But somehow, again, we throw that out when it comes to politicians. Even some pretty entrepreneurial minded people are like, well, if we only put, uh, you know, Vivek in, like all of our problems will be solved. It's like, how many times have we said that? How many times can we say this is the most important election of our lifetime? I mean, it's a bloody circus. You're responsible for your success. You're responsible for your, and I've learned this one the hard way. This one's important, your happiness. Like stop delegating the most important parts of your life to some, some politician. And I don't care mm -hmm. if they're on your side or not, they're still a politician. No, I totally agree with you that it is ridiculous in my opinion. And I think a lot of people who actually leave that I've spoke to as well, it's kind of funny how immediately after they leave, like they'll still look at what goes on, but they yes. most of them immediately say, they're both the same. Like they come to the realization almost having that epiphany of, oh, it's all the same when you actually think about it. But when you're there, I think it is hope, which is just a four letter word, nothing more, that people are trying to cling on to something desperately where they really need to just figure out, and I've said it to people many times, to look to leave. The only way that you're gonna actually do something is by boycotting the country that you're in. You're not gonna change anything. It's like you said, like we, we have so little power and, you know, our only supposed power is to vote. But that's really more of a virtue signaling thing now nowadays anyway. So I think it's better to just go where you're treated best and think that now with online working, it's much easier to do. And, that, and, and I get people say to me all the time, well, what am I going to do? Like, and it's like, what are your skill set? Build, build yeah. it around what your skill set is or what you love and enjoy doing. That was the, that was always a very hard, hard part thing to figure for me to understand. I can be empathetic about a lot of things. I, I was always building stuff since I was 10 years old, writing a magazine and selling it door to door. I mean, to me, finding ways to make money and just executing are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, I stopped filling. You ever get those surveys? Like you, I fly a lot. So I get like, how was how did Qatar Airways do? I just delete yeah. them all. Why? Because I realized Qatar Airways doesn't care whether I was happy or not. Like mm -hmm. my opinions are like, you know, if, if somebody, a small business, if Tina from all states mailing in San Diego, who I've known for 15 years calls and says, Hey, what do you think we can improve? I like Tina and I'm going to tell Tina what, you know, probably not much, but Hey, I'm going to give her my feedback because I think it will be implemented. Qatar mm -hmm. Airways doesn't care and your government doesn't care. And I just think like people keep, when I renounced citizenship, I had to get to the point and I knew I was ready. Mm -hmm. And I talked to some of my friends who I had pontificated about renouncing with years earlier. And they said, you know, I think you're much more content now 
And here's why. There's not any element of revenge in this fork. Now, I have a business. In my business, I mean, it's a very diversified business now, but we still have a, a decent uh, plurality of North Americans who are our, our clientele and our guests at Nomad Capitalist Live. And so uh, I'll talk about the challenges in the United States as a showman, and, and I, I believe everything I say. But I realized it was the time to renounce when I no longer wanted to, like, show them, like, I'm going to show you, you know, like, like people want to hurt themselves because they think, like, everyone else will finally see, you know, how, how much they're missing or something. And obviously, that's a very sad thing as well. But, like, uh, the U.S. government doesn't care if you renounce. No citizen cares. The people who go on YouTube and say, if you don't like it so much, leave. And you're like, yeah, I'm 12 years ahead of you. Um, <laughs> they're not going to be like, oh, oh, well, then by all means, I'm so sorry. I got it wrong. No, then they'll have the exact opposite. How dare you leave? You're a scumbag. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you just told me to leave if I don't like it. No, 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 no. Like, you're not, like, you have to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's selfish. No, that's self-preservation. It's your job to look out for you. It's not anyone yeah. else's job to look out for you. And if you think the politicians are looking out for you, again, I think you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more with that statement. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy world that we live in these days because there's so many different things going on. There's a lot of people who are worried about war. There's different things that are happening around the world, which I think scares a lot of people. And I guess like you probably saw a massive amount of people like an uptick in your business during COVID, I'm guessing, because of all the authoritarian rules. And it was the first time we had people who watched us for years on YouTube. We've got like 2,600 videos. If people haven't seen us mm -hmm. at Nomad Capitalist. People who watched us for years. Okay, this guy's kind of entertaining. There's a Trump impression every once in a while. Okay, yeah, I kind of see his points. But hey, I don't need this. We saw a tremendous increase in families. Up until then, we had a lot of business. We had some married couples. But we had a lot of uh, single like e-commerce entrepreneurs and stuff like that. People who just wanted to reduce their taxes. Because we help people legally reduce, if not eliminate their taxes mm -hmm. uh, by moving overseas. That was a lot of the business. When COVID started and then when crypto came with it and a lot of like-minded people there, it went crazy. And we got, you know, families of 11 in some cases, like extended families, like we need second wow. passport. We need a backup plan. We want to have a big villa somewhere that if this place goes to hell, we can go there. Um, and so it became uh, a lot more involved in helping those people. And I mean, now we have some very well, I mean, we help people who have as little as a million dollars, but we help people who have hundreds of millions and billions of dollars sometimes. And some mm -hmm. of them are like, I want plan G. I want plan A. Forget plan B. Give me B, C, D, E, F, and G. I'm not kidding. I want five passports. I want four residence permits. I want three P editors somewhere else. You know, we had one guy, it's like, I don't want to go to the country. Can you get me a power of attorney? We figured that out. He's like, every time the private jet has to go there, it costs me $200,000. But hey, listen, I'll spend the $200,000 in the private jet if that's my ticket to freedom when this place uh, has a problem and I can go to my house in that country where I became a citizen. I, I think it woke people up that when I started this in 2012, people you know, thought, this guy's nuts. Why would an American need a second passport? Why would I? Okay, fine. Americans have worldwide taxation. There's ways to greatly reduce it if you're an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. Okay, why would a Canadian or an Australian or a British person you need a second passport. Well, now they're seeing why. Boris Johnson was like, mm -hmm. oh, we don't have to need your passport if we don't want to. Justin Trudeau taunted you that maybe you shouldn't be allowed to have a passport if you don't agree with him. Australia mm -hmm. said, okay, you have a passport, but you can't come into your own country, which is like in total violation of all the international law. But who cares? So, and, and then people are like, Oh, but, you know, you go to Malaysia, what does the constitution there say? Well, you know, they, they, I think it's pretty clear that if you're an Australian, you're, you should be allowed to go to Australia, but they didn't seem to mind. Wow. Yeah, that's so. Uh, yeah. So let's talk so... more about Malaysia, where I lived, by the way, where, yes, it did get worse in 2021 after I had left. But when I was there in 2020, I flew back from Myanmar 24 hours before the border closed. I, I've, I've never had a good experience trying to go to Myanmar. It's a bit of botched every time. But I was in Myanmar. <laughs> I came back to see my wife. She said, come on, I think they're going to close the border. I came back just in time and we spent about six weeks, like everybody else, locked down. Malaysia mm -hmm. reopened before Florida did, but they don't have a loud mouth like Ron DeSantis going around flapping his jaw and his little <laughs> white boots. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't know that. 
but it did. So yeah. you can talk all you want about Australia and about Florida and about, about everything else. And by the way, during those six weeks, I mean, there were restaurants in Malaysia that were open because, you mm. know, they're a little more laid back and I, the white people live here. Oh, let them do whatever they you know. I, I, I just think it was a great lesson in soft freedom versus hard freedom. Hard yeah. freedom is written down, but if you don't follow what's written down, who cares? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think more and more going into the future, I think we're going to see like money is going to become hard harder to move and they're going to say oh it's because of war and different things like that and there's central We're already doing that. yeah <laughs> yeah very true i mean the yeah. u.s is one of the worst places for that yeah uh, i mean at least the u.s i'll give the u.s this because they're the ones who harasses everybody else it's easier to move money from there i have a bank account in the u.s i you know i don't get bothered too much i've got a very good relationship with them i think you want to have a relationship with whatever bank you have and i do think people should have banks i mean i, I know some people are just 100 in bitcoin i I'm, I'm for bitcoin but i don't want to be a for being a hundred percent. I think you want relationships with your banker. I, so the US is fine. This is an example where you want a strong jurisdiction like the aforementioned Singapore, where you know they've got a clean reputation and there are some rules, but they're also flexible with you and they're transactional and it just works. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just moved some money out of the Bahamas recently and um, it wasn't that bad, but they, they asked for more things than I would be asked for the uh, by the U.S. Precisely mm -hmm. because the U.S. central bank pressures their central bank, which pressures their banks. So yeah. there's a balance to get with all of this. But yeah, go and try in a Western country to take out 5,000 euros in cash and see what they tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not easy. I know it's not easy. It and we, we have a bank account in the U.S., for our North American clients. And I thought, you know, could we get rid of it? And it's like, because I just don't want the time of the US, but we did it for convenience and it doesn't affect our, our tax friendly status. It's like, no, because when, you know, in the United States, the banks are so obsolete that with many banks, you have to go into a branch to send a wire. I closed my TD Canada account recently. I've had it for um, probably about 12 years. I closed the yeah. account in 11, 11 years. I closed it recently. They had to send me a check to an address, like a mailbox. And then the check took like a month to clear because it's from Canada. I don't have another Canadian bank. I don't want to have another Canadian bank. And I'm just Jeez. thinking to myself, like, everything in North America step into a branch. And if you step into a branch and say, hey, I want to send, you know, X amount of money to Nomad Capitalist in Hong Kong or in Europe or wherever else, you know, you want to pay us. Bankers are like, oh my God, other countries, there must be something terrible afoot. <laughs> and you know, a couple of people over the years have been spooked by that. And it's probably cost me, you know, a hundred thousand dollars over the years. Um, you know, because uh you know, people who thought they wanted to go offshore don't actually want to go offshore. That's the challenge is just this lack of international perspective. And that permeates everything in the U.S. culture. People don't invest overseas. They don't consider options overseas. And I think that's going to be very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. So are there any final thoughts of wisdom that you want to leave us with tonight? Well, I think... You know, go where you're treated best is something that's an ethos for how everyone should live. I think it's how we live in most places. Again, if you fly in Qatar Airways and, and you're not happy with them, you're not going to fly them anymore. And I think that, that we should switch from sending a nasty email to the CEO or leaving a bad comment. Like, who cares? Just take your money and go somewhere else. They're not going to change because yeah. of you. Like, I think that particularly people like myself who are libertarian minded have this kind of ego that like we have this outsized influence and that people care about our opinions and our vote matters. It's like, no, you're one person. There's 8 billion people in the world. Like, let's not be egoistic about this. And so go where you're treated best is a very simple roadmap. Again, it's what you do when you book an airline ticket. It's what you do when you choose a restaurant, it's what you do when you choose a partner. And listen, um, you know, you can choose a partner, but if that person becomes abusive during your relationship, you're probably going to end the relationship. You certainly should. If someone starts, mm -hmm. you know, physically beating you or manipulating you or gaslighting you, I mean, that you might like to keep the relationship because that's how it's always been, but you probably want to, you know, get out of that relationship. I think that we want to look at our relationship with our country like any other relationship, and we want to parcel it out to whichever place serves us best. Most countries in the world are competing with each other. They want your business. You know, Singapore banks aren't going to be just, you know, destitute if they don't get your 200 grand, but mm -hmm. they'd like to have your business in many cases. And I think you should go places where your business is not only tolerated, but celebrated. And that's probably not where you're from. It's certainly not in the United States where they win at nothing except prisoners per capita. It's the only thing they're the best at. Statistically. I mean, so you can argue, you can tell me that, you know, the best beach, it just statistically best at one thing, prisoners per capita. Sorry, like don't, that, that's, 
that's the research. And that's how I think people should have relationships with, with their country. And I'm not saying that, listen, I, I wasn't a big fan of the US. It was an easier decision for me. But when I see how good life is now, and I watch people make that transition, and I see people come up to me all around the world and say, hey, thanks to you, I, I changed my life. I met the woman of my dreams by going somewhere else. I did this, I did that. Go where you're treated best. It's a very powerful concept. And it's what we're going to be talking about for, for four wall-to-wall -wall days uh, this September in Kuala Lumpur at uh, Nomad Capitalist Live. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It will be a great event. Yeah, and you guys, if you want to check out the event, there's a link in the description. Check it out. I will be there speaking. There's going to be many great, exciting speakers, much better than me, that I'm looking forward to seeing and meeting as well. So it will be a fantastic event. So I want to thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on. Thank you so much. We'll see you in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, thank you.